Hey guys, this is Paul, and we are going to be chatting around The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Homer, and I'm sitting here with Cam today. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, this book uh, is incredible. It opens with a foreword by John Ortberg, one of uh, John Mark Homer's mentors, and he says this about Hurry. He says, Hurry involves excessive haste and a state of urgency. Um, and we should make it our aim to live our lives entirely without hurry and that kind of opens yeah. the the scene for the for the entire book um, he also says in that same um, forward he says shepherds really run or at least the good ones and uh it just challenged me to my core and i think it kind of sets the tone <laughs> yeah. for the rest of the book yeah yeah so i think i think what he does i mean we're going to be talking about in, in three separate parts of the book and part one is kind of all about the problem, exposing mm. our cultural issue that I think we think is normal and we even sometimes celebrate. We celebrate hurry, we celebrate busyness. Okay. Um, it's like the busier you are, the you know, the more status you have, you know, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah. How, so, how many guys have you spoken to this week when you asked them how are they doing? And they super chilled. With good, busy, <laughs> just busy. Like, Everyone's just told me super chilled. No, <laughs> no, no, exactly. Like that's, it's, it's not the standard response. The default response is, I'm good, just busy. And I yeah. think that's the, the cultural norm that exactly. this book kind of challenges to yeah. the core. I think it even, I mean, we're filming this, it's the last day of November, am I right? It's the last? first day of December. First day of December? December. I don't even know what the yeah, date is. Exactly. Point proven. <laughs> but uh, this time of year, without fail, every year, everyone is panicking, everyone is running. And it's, it's just like we get on this treadmill and it just becomes our normal, you know? Yeah. So I think about this part one, uh, exposing the problem was, I mean, he gives us a bit of a history lesson around the invention of the clock, you know, in Germany and uh, those kind of things where before the clock, we just, we just lived according to the rhythms of nature, you know? Yeah. And uh, he talks about how, um, how God was in control of our rhythms until the clock came and then it had this alarm and we'd get up to the alarm, not when our bodies said it was okay for us to get up. And uh, then our bosses became in charge of the clock and uh, yeah. And now, so we basically with this industrial kind of development and all these amazing inventions, it's pretty clear that the, the cleverer we get, sometimes the more we get enslaved. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think the, the whole thing of the clock is, it was incredible. Before that time, um, yeah, people, as you say, went with the, the flow of seasons. Um, when the sun set, you went to bed. When the yeah. sun rose, you got up and and uh, it kind of set to a rhythm. And uh, uh, one point that I found interesting where he talks about like these heroes of the faith that were around in those times and how, like, wow, they'd get up at four in the morning to pray and it's like, well, what else have you been doing? You've just been sleeping for 11 hours. Exactly. <laughs> you went to yeah, bed yeah. at five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's a different time. And as you say, um, technology has profoundly impacted just our response to time and life. And it's created a sense of urgency that perhaps wasn't there yeah. before the clock came along. I look at my kids like they often... We say to them, okay, I'll be back in five minutes. And then they're, they're gone for half an hour. And like, their excuse is, but dad, you, don't, you didn't give me a watch. We don't know how long five minutes is. No concept fair, of time. Fair response. <laughs> but uh, I think, yeah, we have become a little bit of a slave to this yeah. thing called time and the watch and that expectation to be there. Yeah, before our friend Thomas Edison, he says, was it, you know, everybody slept 11 hours, you know? It was dark. So, I mean, last night, no power. We had no power here. And so it was like, oh, all right, kids are in bed. I'm going to bed. I was shattered anyway. <laughs> it's like 7.30, snoring away, you know. But that's how it was. Yeah. That's how that, that was normal, you know. <laughs> I think the other thing that was interesting for me was just uh, John Mark's opening kind of statements on the book. He's just like, I have a dream to slow down. Like just 
can we just imagine slowing down? Because we're living at this hurried pace, this uh, sense of wanting to do more. And it's just like, can we just simplify our lives and understand this concept of what abiding is? I mean, you hear about it in scripture, you hear it about it preached on a Sunday every now and then, but what does it look like and how do we do it practically? I think that's that's what I found most helpful about this book. Um, and like, what is the secret to a, to a happy life? Maybe it's maybe it's slowing down. <laughs> yeah. Which is, uh, it sounds too easy. It sounds too simple. It sounds like, uh, okay, like, surely it's acquiring some more stuff or getting more status or yes. achieving more. Yeah. And he's like, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just slowing down. And exactly. um, yeah, I, I, I liked that uh, even though he opens with this thing of the problem, and uh, it's not the main focus of the book. It's like just making us aware, yes. making you go, okay. Yeah. But, uh, but then the, the rest of the focus is on actually the solution and, and yeah. the practices to, to get there. So. I think it's helpful. If, I mean, it, it, it kind of that this first part snaps us out of our, like just our blindness to, to what the problem is, you know. He said, what he says about basically the way the world works now, it's, it's like a virtual attack on our souls. You know, hmm. it's this onslaught on our souls. And if we aren't aware of it, we just go on, we just keep on with the rhythm that it's dictating to us. And our souls are literally just wasting away. No. Um, and it. I mean, what is helpful is that later on in the book, he actually gives us the tools how to do it. But until we're aware of it, okay. uh, we'll, we, we just get sucked into that kind of culture. And we celebrate the wrong things. We. We value the wrong, we value busyness, we value accumulation and what's it, accomplishment, the two idols of our, yes. of, of our culture. And so we become slaves to those two things. They become our gods and we live to serve those two things and, and, and our souls waste away in the, in the meantime. And know? burnouts become like a badge of honor for the millennial generation. It's like, yeah, yeah. hey, uh, when did you burn out? Hey, uh, like. Oh man, I burned out three times last year. How about you? <laughs> yeah, four. Yeah. Like, it's it's absolutely crazy, mm. and uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of a couple of great great quotes. Just um, I think it's old Corey Ten Boom that uh, one who says, "If the devil can't get you to sin, he'll keep you distracted. And yes, just keep you busy, exactly. And just keep you busy with the frivolous and missing out on what's really important." I yeah. Think that's, it's probably one of his greatest strategies because it, it doesn't seem like an evil, doesn't seem like a massive sin. You're not killing or murdering or doing anything horrible, but you're just distracted from what God's called you to. Yeah. I think that's, that's that subtle thing that's, that's, uh, that chapter really just highlighted for me. Yeah. Um, I think that's also cool, like, because it opens up a whole nother perspective on sin and why sin is bad. Because so often as Christians, we've got this legalistic view of sin. I mustn't sin so I can be a good Christian. But the point, the point of it, why, why shouldn't you sin, is because it actually affects your connection with God. Okay. And so he's saying, like, what's the difference? If sin and busyness both affect your connection to God, the point is the connection to God. Exactly. But so often as Christians, we get caught up in this thing of, no, I mustn't sin so because I want to look like a good Christian. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 the point is, you want connection, you, you were created, you exist to be connected to God. Exactly. As soon as you let anything, whether it's sin, busyness, or any, any other thing, come between you and God, you are not living according to what you were created for, you know? Exactly. And so like, I think a lot of hopefully viewers right now and read it when they read this book, I, I, I think there'll be a lot of people that actually still have that view. It's like, oh, no, 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 the point isn't like, I don't sin, therefore I'm a good Christian. No, I, I'm constantly connected with God. I'm living an abundant life. Yeah. That's the point. It reminds me of one of the, the primary definitions of sin. I think people think sin is just not doing the wrong thing. Like one of the primary definitions of sin is to not have a share in, basically to be without inheritance. Wow. It's like a, yeah, yeah. an orphan, basically. And. Um, and I think that's exactly what the enemy is trying to keep us busy and miss out on the share that God has for us every day, like exactly. in a relationship with him. Yeah. Um, yeah, hurry is the devil. That's the one that other quote that I was like, I was like that's, there we go. That's, that's his strategy. Um, yeah. I think, 
the the book's title comes from old Dallas Willard's quote. He says, "There is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life." Yes. In our day, he says, the most, "We must ruthlessly eliminate this hurry from our lives." Yeah. And I think uh, you don't see Jesus ever being in a hurry. And I think I think the other thing is people say, "Well, I've got lots to do," and um, that's fine. You can have lots to do. Jesus had lots to do. There were lots of people that needed healing and deliverance yeah. and, and ministry, but you never see him doing it in a hurried way. I think that's the that's the key. It's like you can have lots to do. It's are we doing stuff that's meaningful and are we doing it in a way that's not hurried? Like I think that's that's the challenge because yeah. hurry just. Uh, if I look at my life, and I think John Mark says it as well, his worst moments in his life was when he's in a hurry. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. It doesn't lend itself to being loving. It doesn't lend itself to being patient and kind. It's, yeah. it's normally your worst moment when you're snapping at your kids or you're not at your best with your wife or uh, you lose it with a colleague or whatever. Without a doubt, it's yeah. normally when you're in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. I remember th- reading that in uh, Del- Dallas Willard's The Great Omission, mm-hmm. which is a cracker, cracker book, a lot more kind of academic. But... Yes. Uh, Talking, I mean, talking about those things, so often we like, I need to remove anger or I need to remove impatience or like a sharp tongue or like those reactions versus responses. Those yes. kind of, I need to remove those. But how often have we been told, well, how to? How to? And so we, I remember reading that and, and I was busy writing a paper on like how to develop disciples, you know, mm. um, the whole journey of discipleship. And it's, Actually, it was the first time when I read that about hurry and haste um, of going, actually, no, (laughs) you don't remove anger. You don't remove impatience. You remove hurry and you remove stress and anxiety and those things will automatically just dissolve, you know? And so these things, it's very difficult like in a moment to, to, they're they're like emotional things. Mm. Whereas hurry and haste and all those things and, and living with margin are lifestyle decisions. And so as Dallas Willard, I mean, I won't, I won't get his, the way he, he describes or defines what a spiritual discipline is, but essentially it's doing something um, by direct effort that will, that will change something that I cannot do by direct effort. You know, so I cannot, it's like, I cannot click my fingers and all of a sudden I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger in his, in his, yeah. you know, heyday, but I can get up in the morning and I can start to train and I can eat and I can start day by day and I won't become Arnold Schwarzenegger, but in however long, months, years to come, if I keep this discipline, I will become what I could not click my fingers in and in an instant and do. And so it's these things that you start to in, uh, like put into your life that all of a sudden, like it allows you to become what you couldn't control. Like you, you were completely out of your control. And so that f- for me was a major, a major thing. And that's obviously what John Mark is really nailing down. It's like, we want to be Christ-like, but, but if you want to be Christ-like, you've got to live the same life as Christ. <laughs> yeah, if you want the life of Christ, you need the, to live the life of Christ. Yeah. You need to live his lifestyle, you know? And that's kind of the, the, the crux of, of what he's trying to get to, you know? It's funny, like we don't see Jesus saying, get up, have a quiet time, read your Bible and pray. But you see him doing it. You see him going away to a quiet place. You see yeah. him withdrawing, going to spend time with the Father. And you're like, okay, well, that's was Jesus. But then he's like, follow me. So are we doing that? Are we, are we actually following his example? Yeah. Maybe there's some truth to following that example. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> maybe there's some life in there. <laughs> Um, the other thing he says is he said, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul I was like mm, yes that is true and uh, I mean Jesus said seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and I think that, that comes from a place of, of not hurrying you can't, yeah. hurry, you can't hurry yourself into the kingdom <laughs> like exactly it's, it's not this uh rapid pursuits of going, I'm chasing after this thing and then I'm going to find the kingdom and find what God's got for me. It's like, no, it's, it's normally in that quiet, still waiting space that yeah. you find it. 
another one that, I, that really hit me was like, we have been distracted into spiritual oblivion. <laughs> I'm like, Ish. Yes. yeah, yeah. I find, I find this book, you, when you read it, you'll, you will continually have these like one-liners that you're just going to, you're just going to hang on to and just like meditate on and chew on. Cause there's so much truth. I mean, John is a, John Mark is a massive reader. And so he's yeah. got a lot of resources, a lot of, a lot of references. Um, but yeah, they are incredibly helpful, incredibly useful. Well, the scary thing is, um, about our attention span going from like <laughs> in, I, I can't remember the, the exact dates that he used, but in a span of a few years, literally dropping like, I don't know, was it four seconds or 12 to are, twelve to eight seconds or something like that? We are losing to goldfish, guys. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> is, that is the scary truth. Like the latest research is saying our attention span has dropped below that of a goldfish. Because yeah. we have this constant influx of cell phone notifications and yeah. emails and WhatsApps and what have you. And um, it's, yeah, it's de- it's definitely doing us a disservice in terms of actually being able to focus on one thing. Yeah. Partial attention is our new normal. That, that's what he. That was one of the lines he said. Partial. So constant partial attention. The inability to give something your full attention. We had so uh, Judah, mm-hmm. who's my boy. He's ten years old. He had uh, a couple of friends around couple of weekends ago, sleep over and the whole deal. And uh, I was brying outside, you'd expect them to come outside and hang with me. But I looked inside, I went inside to fetch something and they all in front of the TV and they're all on tablets. I was like, okay, problem, <laughs> get out. So then it came time, we're eating like Bourbos rolls and I watched them and they're all jumping on the trampoline. So now it's time to eat. They, they're jumping on the trampoline, they're eating their Bourbos rolls and they're talking. And I'm like, in order for them to have a connection, they need to be doing two other things at the same time, eating and jumping. It's, it's like crazy. this, it's just, it, it, it struck me. It was, it was like smash. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, what are we going to do for our kids? How are we going to train them up in this? How can we uh, like help them to see the problem? And then what can we put in their lives that actually creates those boundaries that, that like, yeah, how do we, it's scary. How do we get them to realize that we need to be present in the moment? Like yeah. That's, I think uh, oftentimes I find myself, and these days at work, I'm often on Teams meetings, um, but then I'm listening in one ear, and then I'm checking emails in the other ear, and I'm just quickly updating yes. a spreadsheet on the other screen, and I'm, and I'm realizing I'm not actually present in this meeting. Yeah. Like, and uh, I think that's the technology has allowed us to to be like that. Yeah. Oftentimes, uh, we'll we'll sit at family family lunches with my f- uh, in laws and brother and sister in law, and uh, someone will be on a phone. Someone will be having a conversation. Like it's just we we've become a society and a culture that is so constantly looking for a distraction or something yeah. to because there's this lie that there's something better out there and that the the present is not as good as it sounds. Yeah. I think we need to remind ourselves that the reason the present is called the present is because it's a gift. <laughs> like, <laughs> enjoy the moment, guys. Yeah, yeah. And I'm speaking Powerful. myself because I've been guilty of it myself. Yeah. But um, I think that's that's the age. Uh, the other problem item that he highlights is this thing called hurry sickness and like how it's become a, a common um, definition among psychologists in terms of ailments that people are suffering with today yeah. and uh, I don't know if you went through the list but I went through the list and I was like ish I'm scoring like an 8 out of 10 yeah. <laughs> on the 10J I'm like ah oh, not doing so well <laughs> yeah and it's a symptom Hur- even hurry so where, where anger and those kind of things might be a symptom of hurry hurry is a symptom of, of other things hurry is a symptom of I think of an identity issue Mm-hmm. Of, a, of a need to accomplish something or a, a need to accumulate stuff. Um, it's like this, there's, there's, you're driven by something. <laughs> something is driving you to yeah. hurry in order to gain something. And it's, 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 what he exposes is that your values are out of kilter. Your values are not aligned with what Jesus valued. Yeah. The moment you start to hurry, you, it's like, okay, this is a symptom. What am I valuing that is 
that Jesus didn't value. It's quite simple. It's like mm-hmm. I'm valuing something that this culture is telling me to value and it's going to cost me more than I'm willing to pay eventually, you know? Exactly. Um, and it's just like, okay, what do I need to start cutting out, simplifying, sacrificing? Like this needs to be burned. I don't need this in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man. What, are, what are you running away from and what are you running to? I think that was the other thing you mentioned. It's like oftentimes that internal hurry is like, a, as you say, it's, it's just a, a symptom of something deeper, a root issue that's either causing you to yeah, want more, more status, more stuff, bigger house, bigger car, whatever, um, or you're running away from some hurts or some yeah. thing and you're trying to fill it with other distractions. Exactly, yeah. We actually choose distraction. Like he, he says, like, so even the, the, the instinct to pick up your phone and like put your brain, <laughs> just keep your brain, like r- run away from the silence and solitude, which we, we'll, we'll get to that. But, but like we actually choose to, to busy our brains, busy our minds, because it means we don't have to deal with a whole bunch of things. Like we're distracting them out of, keeping them out of reality, you know? That's the, right. Our real state of being, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, that whole um, list of, of the symptoms of, of hurry sickness, it's, it's, it's kind of things you're seeing really, like anger, irritability, like yeah. just kind of things that people are taking, it's not just normal and just frustrated. Like, no, it's, it's, almost like a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've gotten so busy and so hurried that we haven't had that time to slow down and just let our souls catch up with us. And yes, yeah. There's that um, story he tells of the, the African explorer who, who arrives on the continent and hires some helpers to carry his, his goods into the hinterland. And, and uh, after a day of trekking, the, the locals all sit down and rest. And this guy's like, what are you doing now? We need to push on. We've got territory to go and explore and the locals are like no we're just letting our souls catch up with our bodies yes, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. and this guy's like what no i've got to hurry on i've got to push on we've got things to do and i think uh we don't we don't live in a society that that celebrates looking after your soul and uh yeah. and letting it rest and letting it uh, find a place where it can restore and mm. i think even in, in like a ministry context in the church context where we are pouring out into people, how often do we just take time to let our own souls be restored? Exactly, that's, yeah. For me, that's been one of the biggest challenges of the book is just to find that place because, hey, everything is crying out for our attention. That's the other thing he speaks about is just the, the, the value of attention. We live in a, a society where there are companies that are profiting off our attention. So, be it Facebook, Google, whatever, YouTube, like they have written and designed algorithms that draw your attention. And yes. the more they can monetize your attention, obviously the bigger their profits are. Yeah. And I think um, he quotes uh, one of the founders of Facebook and um, the guy who's now a, I call him a digital, um, uh, what do they call it? Digital ethics? Uh, basically a guy who looks at ethics around okay. digital technology and um, just saying that it's it's really crazy what's happening in, in technology today. They are basically doing things that are unethical to get your attention. And um, I mean, he's saying it's just being aware of it and, uh, and knowing that if you click on something, you're going to get more of it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you... So John Mark, he says, what you give your attention to is the person you become. Mm. And you think about all these different elements, these companies that are literally like, stri- like <laughs> warring for our attention, you know, spending millions to get our attention, like with these hooks. Mm. And essentially, if, if you think about it, if they, are get, if, if they are getting us to give all of our attention to certain things, they are dictating the people we are becoming. Exactly. It's quite scary. No, it's scary. Um, and uh, yeah, so it just kind of shows you, who, like who, who is the master of our souls? Jesus said, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's like these things, the, like, why, why do you click on that thing? What, and then you open a, up a gateway for a whole bunch more to flood in. It's because you, 
you've, de- you've decided that has value. You've decided that is a treasure for you. And all of a sudden you've got this flood of distraction coming your way that's leading you more and more and deeper down that path. And so your, your heart starts to follow the treasure and you become this person. It's quite, like I think we take it for granted, like the, the impact of these little moments, these, these everyday decisions. Uh, and I think if we take stock of it, we take control over it. Um, and I mean, he, he speaks about anxiety being the, like almost an alarm, you know, mm. a, a psychologist saying anxiety is kind of, it's, it, it's, it's our soul's way of telling us that something is horribly wrong. Yeah. And you talk about it, you think of how many people in society suffer from anxiety now. It's like, okay, well, what is that telling us? It tells us that we are not dealing with our souls the way they were created to be dealt with. It's incredible. I think uh, the stats he was showing, I think they were from 2017, that the average iPhone user was touching his phone like 2,600 times a day, which is insane. <laughs> like, it's, it yeah. just speaks to that thing. Like, and uh, I think the thing about our brain's response is that it's a dopamine hit. Every time you hit yeah. that button, you get a response. And I think what's scary is for our kids, whose brains are still being formed, like they're getting that dopamine hit every time they touch the screen. And it's it's shaping oh, the wow. yeah. way they think and feel and experience life. And yeah, I think the other thing he said is that um, hurry isn't just necessarily a disordered schedule. It, it oftentimes speaks of a disordered heart. And that's, I think, what we're, what we're seeing is that those, all those symptoms of anxiety and fear and yeah. whatever people are suffering with that has been put under the banner of mental health oftentimes is speaking to a heart issue. Yes, yeah. And um, I think that's really what John Mark's done well in this, this opening part is is just highlighting the states of our hearts because uh, all of these symptoms of hurry and busy and uh, whatever the, the issues are are speaking to a deeper heart issue. And yeah. So I'm looking forward to part two. I think it's going to be a, good to see what the solution is. Yes. We'll yeah. see you guys in part two. <laughs> yeah.